Well, I'm Matt Jensen uh, today, uh, part of a conversation on theology, imagination, and the arts. I teach systematic theology in the Tory Honors Institute, and I'm glad to be here with four friends and scholars and looking forward to a rich and rigorous conversation. So if we can start on my right here. We have Bill Derness, who's professor of theology and culture uh, at Fuller Seminary, uh, and his most recent book is called Poetic Theology. And uh, to his left is Melissa Schubert, who also teaches in the Tory Honors Institute, uh, specializing in early modern literature, particularly Shakespeare, uh, Spencer, and Milton. To my left is Trevor Hart, who uh, was a co-founder of the Institute for Theology, Imagination, and the Arts, one of the premier institutes for studying at the, the intersection of theology and the arts at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. He's recently retired uh, from an academic position to enter the ministry and as rector at St. Andrews, St. Andrews Episcopal Church. Uh, the first of three volumes of his Poetics of Redemption will be coming out with Baylor Press this next year. And to his left is Jonathan Anderson, uh, not a jack of all trades, sort of a, a, a king of all trades, I think, painter uh, and also uh, quite a theoretician in his own right, writing uh, in Theology and Philosophy of the Arts. Uh, John teaches uh, in the art department at Biola University. I think I'd like to start by asking uh, about the, the nature of love, actually. Um, I was looking at a piece recently uh, that Bill wrote, um, and I think I'd like to ask you all about the role of the arts in the ordering of our loves. That's an Augustinian concept. Uh, Augustine wants to valorize desire. He wants to say that uh, love is a good, good thing. Love is always a good thing, but the real question is about the orientation, the ordering, uh, the direction, uh, and the purity of our love. So I'll, I'll start with that. What is the role of the arts in the ordering of our loves? I think the, one of the things about art is the way it engages our imagination. And one of the things about imagination, however one chooses to define that, is the way in which it brings together various parts of our inner life as well as our outer life, uh, including what I think in biblical terms is very helpfully summed up in the, the metaphor of the heart. Um, and because it's in imagination that we entertain a vision of something that we desire, it's in imagination that we're unable to see things in the world differently, to reconfigure them, to see a different perspective on them. Um, the Scottish novelist and, uh, and poet George MacDonald has a little essay um, somewhere where he talks about um, fostering a healthy culture of the imagination. Um, by that he means that, um, what I think we're all well aware of, that actually attending to certain sorts of things can be deleterious to our spiritual life, our, our inner life, if we concentrate on them too much. And correspondingly, um, attending to certain other sorts of things can be incredibly enriching and sort of reorder our inner life, reorder our imaginary take on the world in a way that attends to the right sorts of things. Uh, he concentrates on, on literature chiefly, that's his field, and uh, so he talks about various texts in English literature particularly that have that effect, he thinks, and, and one should encourage children, one should encourage young people, and, and throughout life to, to read and reread these, these texts as a way of focusing desire in the right places. Um, but I think you could make the same point about other forms of the arts too. Um, some of it really is enriching and shapes our inner imagining in a healthy way. Uh, other stuff, of course, doesn't quite so, so much. I'm impressed that people all always want to make something of what they desire of their loves. They want, they want to inform their projects, uh, their life with the things that they love. And what the arts do is give you models for that. I mean, uh, one of the, the basic understanding of Cologne, uh, people have argued, is to call. So beauty calls us calls us out of ourselves in a sense. And Paul makes the point that whatever's good, whatever is good report, you could think about these things. Let these things inform the projects of your, of your desire. Uh, let, them, let them inform your life. Let them be the, the discipline. And of course, he also adds to Timothy that these things need to be disciplined by the word of God and prayer. We need a, a, a spiritual discipline of these things as well. But that together helps shape us, I think. I think of Dante's Purgatory that pictures this, uh, where the purification of desire would be the cure of the soul, fitting, fitting the souls for paradise. And he, uh, he shows that the experience of purgation is highly uh, imaginative. So. Mm -hmm in his first ring, the, the prideful who needs to become uh, humble, 
uh, the, part of their first process is that they're seeing um, reliefs carved into stone of the exemplars of humility. Um, and then they're also embodying in their, uh, you'd want to call it a body, but they're of course shades of their former bodies, but they are living into a kind of humility bowed down, um, heavy with rocks on their back so that they have to, uh, so, th so that they have to lower their gaze. And, um, and then they start seeing, after they've seen these exemplars of humility, um, Mary at the wedding at Cana and so on, um, then they see pride punished. And so they get about 12 scenes of the full story of the prideful. That's the one that seems the most interesting yeah, to me yeah. where um, Dante's harnessing historical and mythological and biblical examples, uh, not uh, of the moments where the prideful are at their height, but where you see their demise. And it makes me think that one of the ways that um, art uh, objects would be instructing our desire would be um, what moment in the story uh, they tell, what they highlight or draw our attention to. Um, and here for the, I guess, the cure of the prideful soul, uh, they need to see the whole story of a, a part of their soulish life, a part of their desire that they don't see clearly um, as it captures, as it captures them, they don't see it clear, clearly. And so this art uh, in purgatory confronts them with the truth. Mm -hmm. And then also they become storytellers within that realm. They have to tell their story yeah, with some yeah. degree so of So it's not only a process of the imagination, it is accomplished by imaginative products in a mm -hmm. sense, like, yeah. like Nathan's story to David, you know, you are the man, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and, and in that uh, the description, it also points out the connection between the loves and these bodily movements, practices, experiences. I mean, uh, however you read Dante is embodied or not uh, in that story, certainly it's described in terms of... It's visual. It's, yeah, it's visual it's and it's visual. bodily. Yeah, yeah. I, I, think, uh, I think that's uh, one of the ways I would connect the arts and uh, l our loves. Uh, several people, Jamie Smith and others have pointed out the connection between our loves and our bodies, our bodily practices. I think both in terms of our loves being deeply formed through our practices uh, with others, uh, our habits, uh, uh, but also um, kind of um, uh, 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 reformed and, and worked out in those, in those uh, bodily practices. I think what the arts do es essentially is to set aside um, and in some ways isolate bodily practices and aesthetic experiences for the sake of rethinking, rewiring, rehabiting mm -hmm. um, our, our lives. And that is fundamentally an issue of desires and loves, I think. I think the arts have everything to do with what we love. I think too that there's actually something about the way in which we typically nowadays anyway attend to the arts. Um, I mean, reminding ourselves of the fact that this really only goes back a couple of centuries, to be sure. But mostly what we do with the arts is we put them in spaces, whether it's a physical space set aside from the hurly-burly of life, um, or whether it's the sort of imaginative space of sitting down in an armchair um, and just reading a book mm. and being drawn into it. We, we pay close attention to them. And I, I think that in itself is a, a sort of spiritual moral practice, mm -hmm. um, taking seriously the, and, and looking closely at what we see in front of us, uh, which affects the way in which we deal with other people, uh, or should. Um, and I'm, I'm always struck by uh, the little bit at the end of C.S. Lewis's book, um, An Experiment in Criticism, um, where he says, um, you know, there's something that th three things in particular have in common. One is our, our appreciation of beauty. Um, take that for a moment as, uh, as, as a sort of um, catch-all term for the way in which the arts draw us in. Um, the second is love, again, where we tend to be drawn out of ourselves into a close attention to the other. And the third is worship. Um, and they're three distinct things, but they all seem to have the same... Um, capacity to draw us out of ourselves mm -hmm. and to stop us doing what otherwise we do, which is to close in on ourselves and become self-consumed. Um, those are two ends of a very big spectrum, but... Um, so th th I mean, there's a form and content issue here that's interesting. Yeah. So a lot of what you're describing there is the, the mm -hmm. very form 
that my engagement with art takes is, is itself formative of my loves. That is, yeah. theoretically at least, the content could be <clears throat> vastly diverse, but the very fact yeah. that I'm uh, a attending to something patiently in a focused manner without distractions is itself forming me in probably in certain virtues and yeah. certainly certain yeah. habits. Yeah. Uh, how much does it matter the content? I mean, maybe can, let's push that point a bit, can we? I mean, it's how how much does content? Uh, well, that that's a question that my students always ask. You know, well, there's certain things you shouldn't pay attention to. You know, you shouldn't look at. I, I think Paul would have us look at it the other way. Hmm. Pay attention to the things that you should. Okay. What's good? What's yeah. beautiful? Okay. And when you do that, it strikes me you don't worry about mm -hmm. what you shouldn't pay attention because you're going to be so busy. You're going to be so much in love, in a sense, with the things that are worth paying attention to, that, that the other is, is simply not a problem. And I, I think that's what Paul would, would urge us to, re, to, to think about. I think too there are ways of paying attention to things. And um, I think the content obviously is important, but the idea that um, Christians ought not to pay attention to certain things because they are in themselves, in and of themselves, unhealthy, um, uh, not wholesome. Um, I think that in itself is a bit misleading. It seems to me that actually it's important that Christians do pay attention to certain sorts of things, um, but the way in which they pay attention to them will be of a particular sort. Um, I'm thinking um, of Flannery O'Connor's uh, short stories and her novels, which very often are dealing with a pretty seedy side of human experience, but she says, look, that's part of human ex experience. It's part of the world we're in. We live in a fallen world where these things are there. Uh, and while in themselves they may not edify us, there's a sense in which we might redeem them by viewing them in a certain way and enabling others to view them in the same way, to see them in the light of their real state. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a very different sort of being drawn in than I think a sort which is prurient um, or titillated. Um, because finally what that sort of viewing is doing is not actually paying attention to the other in its integrity. It's using the other almost as a form of pornography. In other words, almost as a way of satisfying my desire, getting the rush that I want from it rather than actually viewing it in its own right. Um, and that seems to me to be quite important that we can actually look certain things in the face and, and see them for what they are uh, and share that, that way of viewing them with, other, with others, which of course is what uh, art that comes from a Christian standpoint, um, like Flannery O'Connor's, um, will often do. It shows horrible things, but it shows them in a way which is illuminating um, and finally in accordance with the truth of the matter. She, I've been, I've been, I think you and I have been talking about this all week quite a bit, and at least I've been thinking about it. The, the thing that strikes me about O'Connor is that she so often passes judgment. And in a way, I think that's entirely appropriate and effective and it's in this ap ap apocalyptic kind of manner that we have a revelation of the sordid character of something that seemed to be just sort of common prejudice, and it yeah. turns out to be yeah. wicked. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess I have a question here for artists. Uh, th it strikes me that artists want to do a couple things. So, so one, they don't want to be merely instrumental and didactic. Mm -hmm. They need to be aware of the f that what they're doing is formative. They want to lay reality bare as it is and let reality speak for itself. But then also, uh, because precisely because they're trying to give a true account of reality, th there, there will be some kind of moral orientation. And yeah. so Flannery O'Connor is interesting to me because on the one hand, she's a realist. And on the other hand, she's, she can be even heavy handed morally, but in a way that I think works artistically. So, I mean, yeah. can we talk about how, how all that works together? I mean, very often it's designed to shock. Mm -hmm. And she exaggerates, mm -hmm. you know, the grotesqueness of the grotesque. Um, and she'll turn something that on the surface may look relatively harmless into something that looks really pretty scary and even bizarre um, in order to draw attention to it. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, um, it's important to do that. And it's important that Christians actually learn to look at those things and see them for what they are. Um, and hopefully that uh, folk who are yet, as yet unbelievers will also be able to do that. Um, because at the end of the day, they're part of the world God has made. Uh, they're part of the world that God is concerned for. And I suppose what someone like O'Connor is trying to do, although she doesn't put it quite this way, is to grant us, um, you know, the mind of Christ or, you know, the imagination of Christ, shall we say, mm -hmm. the way God sees these things. Uh, I saw a bumper sticker today, I have to share this with you, um, which said, God doesn't believe in atheists. 
Well, I get the point, but actually I think that's wrong. I think God does believe in atheists. Um, you know, that's exactly the point. He, he believes in them, he cares about them. Um, and the same is true of all the negative aspects of the world, which we might, if we were wanting a comfortable existence, simply edit out, you sort of airbrush out of the picture. But we can't do it um, because we're called to reckon with the world as it is and to be redemptive in engagement with it. And part of that is seeing it for what it is and showing it for what it is. One of O'Connor's famous quotes is she says, you know, her fiction tries to show the action of grace in territory held largely by the devil. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. just when you say yeah. seeing the world as it is, in part that does mean acknowledging perhaps yeah. <laughs> that there are ways that the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. That would be the wrong thing to only say yeah. about the world. Mm -hmm. but, but to say it yeah. is also Faithful. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, 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 if I could play devil's advocate here, I mean, let's say something like this. Um, she is, uh, so she offers these grotesques, which are not recognizably realistic. If, if, if I'm an artist, I might, well, so feel free to push no, back, because this is the overdrawn <laughs> devil's advocate moment. If I'm an artist who's concerned, uh, maybe particularly a Christian who's an artist who's nervous about Christians whose art is, is overly didactic, I'm thinking, well, gosh, that's a, that's a great cartoon, but I don't recognize uh, I don't recognize reality in that, actually. This is not reality as most people experience it. Um, when does something, um, she's so good at what she does, I wonder if she's not an exception, uh, when really, I mean, maybe she's just a bit of a moralist. I, I just think, personally, so I don't know what to make of this, but I think, oh, if I think about O'Connor or Dostoevsky and the ways that, um, they're drawing these pictures that seem sort of wild and, and, and wildly unrealistic, but as ever, whenever I read, I feel like, ah, yes, there I am. There, there you are. Um, I, so, so I have the experience of recognition, even in this project of, um, I guess, writing uh, some kind of what you're calling exaggeration, and that exaggeration could be too didactic. I don't know. I don't know what to so make there, of. So there's a certain maybe there's a certain kind of moral, emotional, psychological realism, even though uh, it's got a it's got a kind of cartoonish feel to it. I mean, there, there are the kinds of episodes that aren't going to happen in real life. Well, she famously said that, that she does that to get people's attention. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because I think you could argue that uh, certainly in the, the work we're doing in modern art, I mean, there's an approach to evil and suffering that's ironic mm -hmm. or uh, deadpan, uh, Warhol's, uh, you know, uh, images yeah, of serious. traffic accidents and things which are which are really kind of deadpan, and, and they're not really they're not really dealing and facing with uh, facing the issue in the way that she she would say you need to do, mm -hmm. and in her case, the experience of this almost becomes a mystical experience that she can turn on its head, mm -hmm. because the evil can can be there's something else there that can be redeemed. In fact, one of my students wants to use the the notion of anagogy mm -hmm. with her with her work. The, uh, the apocalyptic can be a kind of anagogical moment there. I think there's something interesting yeah. about that. Just a quick parallel, sorry. No, go. Um, I'm thinking of a less heavily didactic thing, but I saw the James Turrell uh, retrospective, was it, at, at LACMA, and um, we're being saturated in a sort of, can we, a crafted experience of light mm -hmm. for two or so hours, mm -hmm. made a radical difference uh, in my experience of light as I experience it naturally or normatively, um, that, that strikes me as bearing analogy to what O'Connor's doing. Mm -hmm. She, of course, is doing that with respect to distortions that are coming. Uh, she's drawing attention to distortions in, in moral life or in social realities. But even just saturating uh, a person in an experience of the phenomena of light mm -hmm changes what I can experience yeah. Yeah. of light in its less acute presentation. And you won't think about light again in the same way. I hope not, <laughs> yeah. That's good. That's good. And I, I, so, I mean, I, th I think what that brings up is art, art has to do with cultivating our sensitivities. I mean, that's really what it is. Mm -hmm. And there's so many different moves that you can make to do that. And I think that uh, appreciating that broad range is very important and might in, in some sense not be a matter of realism, non-realism, but uh, 
uh, the uh, question of sensitivities. So, for instance, uh, Connor, uh, O'Connor and uh, other fiction writers are creating worlds that in one way or another, if you enter that world, will sort of realign, reorganize your sensitivities to some extent. Whereas Warhol, I think it really is just strategies of interruption, like interrupt, sh interrupt our um, uh, consumption of images, right. glamorous and tragic. Mm -hmm. uh, and that interruption has been really powerful mm -hmm. for me and others in sensitizing myself to mm -hmm. the consumption of images and to uh, my objectifying of people and events and so forth. Uh, and I think that's uh, so there's a, a place for that. Warhol does that. Yeah. Terrell uh, is sensitizing ourselves to the light that floods our lives every day in all sorts of nuances and wonderful ways. So there are all these different moves ranging from didactic uh, responses, answers, to just bare, really bare bones interruptions. And all of those can be, I think, organized Christianly. Um, and come from a Christian. I've been wanting to ask position. this question of two, and this is a wonderful time for me to learn from all of you. Uh, there's a big sort of movement that art shouldn't be didactic and so forth, and yet when I study medieval art, it, it's nothing if not didactic mm -hmm. and formative. Mm -hmm. In other words, it, the whole purpose of uh, its creation was to form you in certain ways and to teach you certain things, and it had certain uh, clearly didactic purposes. So uh, isn't there a sense in which we can feel good about recovering that. I, I wonder how much the, the, the contemporary awareness of the audience plays into this. So, so it seems, at least the artists I talk to, have a real concern, um, I think, to acknowledge uh, the diversity of forms of reception of a piece of art. So as I'm thinking about even this formation or the didactic piece, it, it seems that formation, so John, I hear you trying to carve out space for a, a real radical diversity of forms of formation. Mm -hmm. And therefore, th th there's a certain kind of accidental character to formation. I'm over saying that, but it's, um, my attention can't be um, directly fully realized in the formation of my audience. And so, I mean, maybe there's something there about recognizing um, the forms that the reception will take so that, yeah. I mean, it's. And, and the expectation and of the audience. Yeah. That, yeah. that yeah. what you're picking yeah. up on. Yeah. Certainly That's in the diversity true. of forums yeah. as well. It's yeah. not all yeah. church art, it's not all. I mean, yeah. in a sense, isn't it the case that the point of view that art ought not to be didactic is itself a didacticism? I mean, <laughs> yeah. art ought not. So then what is it? So then we're saying what art is and what art should yeah. be. Um, but actually, if you read some of the, uh, for example, Oscar Wilde, who you know, famously plays with that at the beginning of the picture of Dorian Gray, and then you read the picture of Dorian Gray, and you come away fr from it with nothing, if not a very clear sense of where the boundaries between good and evil lie in the world. Um, now, perhaps he would say he wasn't being didactic, but he certainly teaches you something, um, you know, unintentionally or otherwise. I suspect otherwise. I think there's a certain irony about that little preface at the beginning. But um, there are other ways of, of, of doing the thing, of showing people the world um, in a way which seeks to reflect the truths and the realities of it. Um, sometimes it's done, you know, not by, as it were, seeking to uh, lay out um, those realities directly. It can be done obliquely. Um, or it can be done by way of, uh, of, of negation. So, well, C.S. Lewis and the screw tape letters, what's he doing? He's showing you the world from a demonic point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and if you read his letters, actually, he, he really struggled with that. And, and he said, you know, it, it was a, a spiritually and pastorally quite difficult time for him. It wasn't a light mm -hmm. uh, task mm -hmm. to undertake. But what it does is it defamiliarizes you. It, it, in other words, shows you the world in a light which you don't normally see it from. Um, but, but in order actually to reinforce certain things um, by way of, of, of opposition. So you, you immediately swing around and see things uh, from the way ultimately he hopes you will see them. Um, and a lot of novels um, do that it seems to me that by using this technique of point of view rather than bringing in the, the omniscient narrator you know, the, who tells you certain things about the characters that you really need to know. Um, sometimes it can be a, a strategy of, um, of gradual unveiling. Um, so at the end of the day, you've been drawn into a protagonist's point of view. You've gone a certain way in the novel with it, and suddenly you realize something. So you're complicit mm -hmm. in something that you suddenly realize isn't where you want to be. Um, and th again, that's another way of drawing you into to help you see the world differently. Uh, not now by telling you how it is, but by, as it were, leading you by the hand until you reach a point where you think, 
this isn't right. Um, and then suddenly something's revealed which then shifts your perspective. Um, could be very disorientating when it happens. Um, but but it's I, I, I think it's this imagination and orientation. This right. is where your work is so key because yeah. Anna Karenina, uh, if you walk away from Anna Karenina and think uh, divorce will mess you up, th that's true. Yeah. Um, but that's all, I mean, is, is that what Anna Karenina is about? Well, yeah, yeah. yeah well, it's, it's really about the orientation of the imagination such right. that you yeah. are able to see through the eyes of another and walk, I, th I think, Melissa, you said, enough of the story, see, see it really laid bare so that you see it all the way to the end. But it's all of this is imagination and orientation yeah. that's going on here, such that yeah. if I were to say that the meaning of Anna Karenina is that divorce will mess you up, um, that's a bad answer on a test. Precisely because it's yeah. the wrong form of answer. We need an essay, not a fill in the blank, not yeah. a multiple choice. I mean, it's, yeah. so there's something in there yeah. that, I, that makes me want to hold on to something about the didactic, at least yeah. narrowly conceived. Because yeah. often uh, didactic is just, like when we use that term, it's just shorthand for someone's telling you what to think, yeah. but not uh, ushering you into an imaginative space or way of being in the world. Uh, and we don't have to back away from the moral component because actually, if if I had a, a 18 year old who I really wanted to understand that divorce will mess you up, I might give him Anna Karenina yeah. and let him saturate in that. So it's not so much that thinking in terms of uh, this more indirect formation of the imagination, it's not that that backs me away from a deep moral formation, but it's, the, it's, it's just doing a different kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. What, I, what I think you're saying and, and specifically what I think I just heard from you, John, was something like, um, that, that the reason we might say art's not didactic, it's when we're using didactic to mean an explicit message of instruction, but that we're wanting to say together that something about envisioning and imagining and, um, and, and becoming submitted to the imagination of another is still didactic in the sense that it might, it might yeah. transform or change or um, meaningfully mm -hmm. uh, move the, the subject of the art, uh, or sorry, not the subject, the person who's viewing, the person who's experiencing. Well, it, it, does it or should it order our love to return to our, mm -hmm. is this something I should love or it's something that I can love mm -hmm. or is this something, no, I, I shouldn't, you mm -hmm. know. Can, can, I, can I turn this to the question of artists in the church? So I'm actually surprised that some of the shape of this conversation has been to say something like, well, well, no, we don't need to back it all away from certain forms of teaching and forming through art. Um, I know enough artists in the church who are being constantly, uh, they receive constant demands to justify their art with, re with reference to some very direct and specific formative ends. That is, you better have a reason for doing this and it better be because it's explicitly good for the church in this way. Um, so I feel the need on the other hand is to, for them to have a certain kind of freedom from justification. So uh, you, can you all speak to that at all? The, the question of the justification of artists in the church. Well, I think uh, I've thought a lot about this because I think that that's a, a confusion of categories. In a certain sense, uh, churches like that don't have a, a, a way of being that they're comfortable enough with that they can invite art into that process. Uh, highly liturgical churches, that, that, that's, not, that's not a problem because th they say the liturgy drives our formation, therefore it should drive, drive our art. Mm -hmm. The liturgy leads and, and the arts support imaginatively, just as it's always done in the Middle Ages and so forth. Now it's a form of didacticism, but it's, it, it's, it's a form that, that that kind of liturgical church is comfortable with it because it, it has its sense of identity that says it's grounded in these sets of practices that have this the rich tradition behind it and, and the art should serve it. But in our evangelical churches, we, okay, we're, we're gonna we're gonna preach and that's all. You know, we're gonna have a Bible study and that's all. So, so uh, we don't we're not comfortable with what goes on in the service, in terms of actions, what we look at, what we uh, uh, what the kinds of things that, that the movements that we make and, and and rituals, we're not comfortable with any of that. So art, which of course deals with all of that. Uh, immediately is under suspicion because it has to be has to be reined in it has to it has to it has to just be didactic in the sense that that's that's what the the center of worship is which is the preaching of the word uh, rather than these rich imaginative practices 
I, I've, I've just finished the research where I've compared our worship with uh, Islam and Buddhists mm. and see how strangely our, our, our whole focus is on, oh, you believe this. Well, if you, if you ask a Buddhist that, you put them immediately at disadvantage because what they believe is, in a certain sense, neither here nor there. I mean, it's, it, it doesn't matter. It's sets of practices that they find enriching. Mm -hmm. Well, that just really doesn't com compute mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. But then maybe it ought to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, too, there's a question about um, artists who happen to be Christians, let's put it that way. Um, the freedom they feel to work in ways that aren't necessarily directly intended for the life of worship and the church at all, but, but are for the world. So um, as artists, they will follow a vision and unpack it and um, you know, they know what their calling is, they have a sense of what they want to do, and sometimes it will be more closely related to uh, some semi-utilitarian uh, role within the church's life, whether it's decorating the church or uh, accompanying the liturgy or whatever it is. Um, but very often it won't. Very often it'll just be doing their art and doing it well in the world. And I think it's disappointing that, and I, I don't think this is peculiar to, uh, to evangelical churches, it's certainly more common in Protestant churches still, um, you know, however many years after the Reformation we are, um, that we seem to have a hard time making sense of the idea that um, art is something serious and important for Christians to be engaged in um, and providing the sort of uh, support networks for that. Because at the end of the day, um, art is one of those professions which is extremely hard to sustain because it's uh, very often there's not much money involved unless you happen to get into the little jet set of um, you know, uh, public figures who can sell things for millions and millions of dollars. Most artists are not there. They're, they're, they're working away in, uh, you know, in messy conditions, doing their thing um, and putting it out there. And, what are they doing? Well, they're, they're taking the stuff of God's world, um, materials of one sort or another, whether it's uh, oil paint and you know, uh, canvas, or whether it's clay, or whether it's words, and whatever it is. Uh, and they're doing something to it to transform it, to reconfigure it, um, to make more of it than, than is given simply in the materials alone, and offer it. Um, and I don't mean offer it necessarily technically in worship, although of course it, that is doubtless what they feel they're doing um, when they themselves come to worship, but to offer it to the, to the community, to offer it to the world and also to God. Um, and I think that's a, just a, an important paradigm uh, of what we are called to be and to do as human beings more broadly. So Christians really, the church ought to have an, a vested interest um, in supporting and encouraging and giving artists who are Christians the freedom to do that and to feel that this is a good and an important thing to do. Um, but very often they don't um, and it's, it's very disappointing and I, I know a lot of, of artists who feel frustrated by that, that actually what they do is not taken seriously or not valued except as a utility, except as a tool occasionally um, to lubricate the worship or to enrich the visual experience uh, in a sanctuary. John, I, well, I, John I, I want to put you on the spot yeah. if you don't mind because so here, here's an artist who happens to be a Christian, an artist in the church, who has his own independent practice that's, that's sort of the own, his own art he makes, but who also has had a significant role to play in the art in his church, which is a brethren church, so there's none, it's kind of running foul of all the stereotypes we've got here. This is not high liturgical setting, but it is a church that is at least is sought to be sensitive uh, to the artist in its midst. Can you just talk through some of that? Um. Yes, uh, I, I, I want to do the, so this way though, uh, by kind of piling on some of the problems. Because uh, <laughs> um, uh, I, I agree with everything Trevor just said. Um, but I think w once you do have churches that open up, uh, especially evangelical and Protestant churches that do open up to the kind of need for the arts, then you, uh, what a lot of artists experience who try to step into that space is a kind of cultural vacuum of sorts. Mm -hmm. So without a culture uh, w where you're raised in the church knowing how to do arts for the church, mm -hmm. if you don't have that culture, then you are either borrowing usually from uh, models of um, entertainment, like arts, arts as entertainment mm -hmm. on the one hand, and we have lots of that, lots of film, lots of concerts that uh, fill our churches. Um, on the one hand, 
or you have professional trained artists who come out of an MFA program, for instance, and their mode of, of artistic engagement is the one of disinterested contemplation uh, in a gallery or in a, a museum. So all of the artists, for the most part, who are working in the churches now are either co-opting the mode of entertainment or the mode of disinterested contemplation. And I don't really think either of them is really appropriate for the space of the church. Um, or at least they might be, but they're problematic. They, they bring a whole lot of baggage and train. Can, so, can I just briefly throw one more? Art yeah. as craftsmen. So that might be the other one is that they come uh, in, they use sort of low-grade craft work because sure, they're the artsy. Sure, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. you've used that in your church too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So the, I mean that so you uh, you do have huge question marks uh, because there's not a culture uh, of the arts very often by which to make sense of and that you can rely on the congregation bringing to the engagement with the work. Huge That's problem. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. But I think we need to ask the question behind that and ask ourselves why is this this true? And it's true because of who the patrons are. There's patronage, we're in Southern California, there's patronage for the entertainment industry. So you have, you have patrons for that kind of art, all kinds of that kind of entertainment film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have patrons, to a certain extent, for the people that are gonna show in galleries. There are people that wanna put up their art in their house. But the church is missing in action in terms of patronage, mm -hmm. and, and, and Christians pretty much in, in general. Bruce Herman has just published a book with Walt Hansen that addresses this problem because Walt, of course, has been his patron. Mm -hmm. So this is a conversation between artist, Christian artist and a patron talking about this, about th there's, there's a problem here, that there's not an economic substructure. I'm being kind of Marxist here, but I mean, if that, that, that's the case. Yeah. It's the issue of patronage is a hugely important issue. Uh, there's the forms of patronage too, I'd want to start just briefly, forms of patronage too. So there's uh, people who have uh, economic resources who will be able to quite literally fund uh, art making. There's also, you know, I think about my church, which uh, does not have a, uh, a rich arts life, but, but have some uh, really great artists, Andy and Sam and people that John knows. Uh, and one woman one day uh, got up, occasionally we'll have people who give Christian testimony, and she got up and gave her testimony through her art. And this is, this is a not well-educated um, congregation in terms of the arts at all. But part of her invitation into her life was an invitation into her art. Mm -hmm. and, and I like that as a way of, so she's educating, she's inviting in, and she, there's a certain kind of transparency, but there's even a sense of um, slowly teaching the congregation how to be a certain kind of patron in the sense of we, we see you, in fact, we see you as artists. We're glad you're an artist and we receive all of you in that. So it doesn't solve the economic problems, but I do think it's a significant yeah. piece of integrating artists who often feel like, y you don't know that I paint stuff. Yeah. Um, and in fact, she face paints, but if we hadn't seen her give this testimony, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have seen the beautiful work um, she produces as well. So, so it, uh, you asked about my own involvement. Uh, so first, uh, it really is a sort of uh, kind of uh, crisis of sorts, what to make, how to make it, what form to mm -hmm. expect. Um, so uh, uh, I made a huge, Work. It's like 12 by 25 feet uh, image at the fr at the front of our church. That was, uh, I mean, sort of uh, um, the the church really uh, embraced it and supported it, uh, and has has been wonderful. But it also, I still feel somewhat conflicted about what it is and what how it's functioning in the church. Uh, I, I mean, I certainly tried to uh, tie it in with art history and with uh, kind of uh, um, uh, uh, biblical narrative. It's a tree of life uh, front. Uh, so there's loads of history, church history. Uh, and we often, in this kind of cultural vacuum, default to 500 years ago or mm. more. Uh, so tried to do that, but it's also a kind of very contemporary image uh, in a lot of ways, a very conceptual image, really. It's, it's, a uh, it's. Can you, can you name your conflict as, as well as your it, It's, it, it's, um, um, what is, what is this, uh, doing in the church? <laughs> I mean, how is it functioning? Like, what is it doing in terms of an action? Is this, are, are we as a congregation slipping into the default modes of, 
um, entertainment, consuming entertainment. Mm -hmm. After all, we're sitting in a room that looks very much like a theater with a stage and there's a front and this, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's the size of a movie projection screen, you know. Do we slip into that default mode because that's how we've been trained, really, trained ourselves to engage it? Or uh, me and the rest of the artist friends, are we kind of sort of sitting back and thinking about its conceptual implications and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. uh, or, is it, or is it doing that other thing that I'm not really sure what it is supposed to be doing in the church? Wor worship, leading people to worship. And I think it has done a, a fairly good job of that and we've kind of framed it verbally in a lot of ways to help that. Uh, but it is still an open question. Is, is it permanent or is it only it's, period of time? And, um, and what's the period of time that it was f up for? Um, uh, Open-ended. Okay. Uh, it's made to be removed in 10 minutes mm -hmm. if need be, uh, but it has been up for mm, um, close to a year or so. See, th this Maybe is, not quite a year. This is an interesting question because what strikes me about the art that does appear in churches, it's it's here today and then taken down. So it's, it's, it's part of our, is that part of our consumer culture? Or uh, in other words, does it do anything permanently? Or is there any permanent role? Because you think of the tradition of Christian art is nothing if not permanent. I mean, the altarpiece wasn't made to be taken down during Christmas, you know. In fact, it was to be opened up <laughs> during that time. So uh, wh what's that about? But then that's our culture, which is a, a culture of, novelty and, and so maybe we have to live with that. How, what, how, how do we manage that? I mean, how do you feel about that as an artist? I mean, w w will you feel bad when it's taken down or you made it with that expectation? Or I, I made it with that expectation and told the church when it was mm -hmm. presented, this is not about an, an artist uh, uh, presenting something as an expression of himself or something like that. This is a this is a, a gift that I did in the best way I knew how, but it is now yours. You have no obligation to me. It can, it's an offering. It can That's be nice. removed. That picks yeah. up on your be point. Because that yeah. whole kind of um, authorial grasping over the thing or expression is, is not the mode of engagement so, so that I want. So if the church doesn't have any obligation to you in, in that wonderful moment of offering, do they have obligation? Is there, is there some direction of the obligation to, to the art object, uh, which is now a liturgical object, to... Uh, the God to whom it's meant to point, to the congregation as a whole, to, I mean, w would you want to place obligation somewhere else on the congregation? Yourself being a part of the congregation? What's the responsibility? I mean, I guess, I guess the, uh, the real obligation is, is to God, ultimately, and to the congregation. What, what is uh, most conducive to the worship of the congregation and the, the unity of the congregation. Uh, and if, I, th I mean, I, I guess I'm very Protestant in this sense that if, it, if, if the thing I put up there is inhibiting that, then take it down. Uh, and if it is contributing to that, then leave it up. Uh, contributing to what now, that, what's the that? Uh, the the uh, worship of the community and the, the unity of the community in Christ. Which is? What's that? Tell me more. What, what is <laughs> that? I mean, I guess uh, it's can the uh, does the community come together in that space to um, perform the gospel okay. weekly and to celebrate praise uh, okay. and, and to celebrate God, to celebrate the grace they've been given, to celebrate the life they've been given, um, uh, and to uh, kind of. Uh, love one another as themselves. I mean, if the art can participate in that, mm -hmm. great. That's good. I mean, that I ideal. Because we interviewed your pastor, as you know, for the study I did, and <laughs> he, he made it, Hausman, he made it clear that it's the story that's the center, and we want to integrate people into the story, and, and it's the message that we want people to, to be integrated into that, which is a, a very good expression of yeah. a, a way evangelicals would yeah. understand. It, visual art can... I mean, it feeds that story. It helps to shape what we might call the, you can either call it liturgical space or imaginative space. Mm -hmm. It feeds into it. And I think, you know, worshiping in a space where certain things are there in certain places has a vital role to play in that. Um, 
going back to, to Bill's point about variation and the tendency for it to be a constant conveyor belt of, of different things, I think it's, it's a question of balance because certainly in the churches, in the church I s serve as a pastor in, it's an Episcopal church, so we have a liturgy, but the liturgy varies from season to season. So if you're thinking of whether the way words function to shape that space, which is of course um, precisely by uh, engendering images, they just happen to be images in the mind's eye, not ones uh, on the wall or at the front, um, then there is variety. And actually it's good that there's for the variety. And uh, what we try and achieve is a, is a balance between a sort of familiar structure, mm. um, which remains relatively constant, um, and variation in the particulars to reflect whether we're in Advent, which is just about upon us, and, or Lent, or wherever it may be. Um, and I think you could do something similar with, with images. I mean, it is true that visual art in churches has tended on the whole to be fixed, whether it's you know, altar screens or, or whether it's paintings, very often on the walls, of course, so you couldn't really move them, <laughs> except by knocking the wall down or painting Stained over glass them. or whatever. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I actually think it's quite an advantage that we can, without slipping into the cultural thing of a constant stream of images, mm -hmm. where there's no permanence, there's no standing still, there's no fixity, um, I think still that combination of uh, familiarity on the one hand with some variation on another, perhaps seasonal, perhaps done for some other reason, um, is actually quite a good thing. And it, it really depends on the nature of the, of the artwork. I mean, something that big, you don't want to be moving it every five minutes, right? But, um, and when you take it away, do you take it away and store it and that's it? Or do you take it away and then at a certain time when it seems good to do so, you, you bring it back? And in the meanwhile, there can either be nothing there or there can be something else there, which in some, some other way stimulates a different part of the, the story um, and tells that story in a visual way. But see, there again is a church that has a sense of its own yeah. story and the yeah. way the story is liturgically understood in the, yeah. over the course of the Christian year, which includes, of course, different uh, colors for the stole. So it, yeah. it's already visual and things uh, so that, that you already have a head start toward thinking visually about, your, uh, about that. I'm glad we have a head start in some things. I wouldn't say <laughs> <that's> <laughs> can I put you on the spot with a question? I'm, all the work you've done in, um, seems like some of your most significant work has been in uh, Christian appropriations, maybe translations, <coughs> um, reconfigurations of the core Christian story. I mean, in, in various different ways. But uh, I'm wondering something about what it looks, uh, what a faithful telling, um, maybe sp specifically of the Christian story entails. Do you have any thoughts on that? Hmm. So right now, what I'm drawn to in art, uh, I think I'm, you know, I'm thinking of poetry and, and fiction right now. Um, that, that I read of contemporaries that seems to me particularly faithful, uh, faithfully Christian telling of the world. Um, I think of Marilyn Robinson, and I'll, I'll speak specifically maybe to Housekeeping, her, her first novel, um, though, I, though I think what I see there uh, plays out in, in her other fiction. Um, I think that there's something about um, tellings of the world that, uh, that don't overpromise what our experience, um, terrestrial experience of the fullness of uh, him who fills all things um, will be. So I, I love work that gestures towards um, a promised fulfillment, but fully acknowledges the ways that there is either deficit or um, remained or deferral, I suppose would be the, the word I'd prefer. So, uh, so Robinson, I think, to my mind, has, has evoked and crystallized what I take to be an appropriate um, kind of Christian longing uh, mm -hmm. as we make sense of um, our experience across time in, in housekeeping kind of an early scene is the girls, uh, the girls that the story follows, they're, they're abandoned, their mother leaves them. Um, and, and so the narrator says, she remembers sitting on the porch uh, after her, the mother had left and had said she would return. And she said, somehow um, this made me believe that the most important, um, the most important part of any moment is uh, the most, I wish I had, uh, sorry, I could do this faithfully. The most important part of any moment is what isn't present in that particular moment. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
that which is absent, mm. but, but palpably absent, right. um, mm. becomes the significant part of the experience. Later in the novel, the narrator talks about this, um, this experience of absence and of craving, to crave and to have, she says, are, are almost the same. Uh, mm -hmm. that craving suggests its fulfillment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so there are a couple luminous uh, moments, though they're all capturing this, um, this experience of the absence of the things we long for, uh, but I'd say baptizing an experience of absence to say absence itself suggests fulfillment. Uh, yeah. She says, uh, what are all these fragments for if not to be knit up finally? Mm -hmm. So I love uh, how her imagination is willing to observe and even evoke more than sometimes I'm willing to feel uh, the fragmentation of life, the, the acuteness of, of longing and, and loss. Mm -hmm. To observe that um, and tell a fuller story but not, uh, to, uh, but not to pretend or counterfeit a kind of fulfillment um, as if it's already present. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is, I'm so glad you brought that up. But Melissa and I have been going back and forth, partly because we're dear old friends who share s all sorts of common tastes. I mean, I think I often just anticipate you're gonna love something that I've loved. And I mentioned the book by Leif Anger I just gave to Trevor called Peace Like a River. I loved this book and Melissa said, oh, <laughs> and we had, we had a quick conversation, but I realized I, I, I felt a little, I felt disappointed in Marilyn Robinson's work. I have enough friends who I trust implicitly, like Melissa, that, that I'm more and more compelled to go back to her work. Um, here's where I think we disagree, um, and I think, it's, uh, I think it's instructive on this point. Um, so there's this sense of distension of longing and desire in her work that we sort of strain out for What's promised, the, the regathering of things, but, but the regathering is something that is left out. Um, in one sense, for Christians, appropriately so, because this is, uh, the, the end is something that is brought by God in Christ. It's never something to which we can uh, slowly march or that we can build on our own. Where I find myself dissatisfied um, is I think uh, it, it, it feels an underrealized eschatology to me, I mm -hmm. suppose, at the end of the day, in the sense that, so we, we hear in the New Testament that the Spirit is a down payment or a, or a foretaste. And that's, to me, the Im image there. So on the one hand, I love that Robinson holds out craving as almost a having. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm wrong, uh, triumphalistic, um, naive to think mm -hmm. that the Spirit will bring me the main course. But I think I'm also, I, I know I'm also wrong to think that the Spirit will, will leave my stomach empty. He, he brings an appetizer. He brings some taste of the future. And Trevor, so much of your work is picking up on uh, Moltmann's sense that, that the future impinges on the presence. Now, now in surprising ways, uh, in ways that leave us hungry for more, craving for more, but still that nevertheless, and this Tolkien's idea of eucatastrophe, that, that there are ways in which the resurrection will interrupt our life, sometimes in moments of extravagant joy and satisfaction, even if they're inserted into a narrative that leaves us wanting until the end. So, so yeah. You, you can't make her into something that she's not because... That, Robinson. That, ha, Robinson, because mm -hmm. having grown up in the Midwest, I mean, it's so Midwestern in, mm. in, in, in her. It's a sort of via negativa that, you know, you, you, you shouldn't enjoy life too much and yeah, things. Yeah. But, but they're, they're, what she does with that is wonderful. I mean, yeah, because she yeah. does have moments in Gilead where she says, when we, when we get there, we're not going to lose all this. This is going to be our Troy. You know that, that section that yeah. she says, this is going to be remembered and sung about like Troy mm -hmm. the, 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 was, was remembered. So that, that she has, has moments, so sort of the luminous moment, moments there. But you're right. But I think that's just very much her, her sort of Protestant vision about the way things are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, and I think that's a place where uh, I, I think myself and a lot, of, a lot of my students, a lot of my friends, we're nervous about happy endings and about um, resolutions. A lot of that nervousness is appropriate. A lot of it is appropriate response to the kind of kitschy, um, saccharine accounts of Christians yeah. right. uh, doing art. And so I think mostly that's polemically appropriate, but I also think it's insufficient. And in fact, it's insufficiently Christian. And I think that's where I have uh, some pushback. What but, yeah, go ahead. My, I'm going to put Gilead in my mind too now and thinking, uh, 
of when John Ames gets to um, bless the, the son who mm. he's afraid he didn't baptize well. Um, and he gets to bless him, but, uh, but knows that the story is utterly unresolved. Right. Um, yeah. Still, after this moment of blessing, he says uh, he'll keep it quietly. He won't tell the boy's father. Mm. But then he says there are thousand, thousand reasons to live this life, mm. uh, every one of them sufficient. Yeah. So I think in that moment, the character at least, and you know, I suspect Robin's in there too, is actually observing the very thing you're describing, the, mm. the, yeah, the yeah, tasting nice. yeah. of, of heaven. It's just in something so much smaller yeah. than we often want to say, right. yeah. here's, here's the spirit uh, giving us um, signs and seals of what's mm. to come. Mm. She, she, her, John Ames at least, says that came to him in a moment of being able to, to bless, um, to bless this man. But it's kind of a special grace. It's not, it's not the ordinary. It, well, it's a way that yeah. preserves, I think, the sovereignty of grace too. Yeah, that's in right. That it says, that, that's it what says you would want. The, the eruptions of the resurrection of the present, mm -hmm. I just don't get to script them. I don't get to anticipate them. And in fact, I fall into them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're in the darkest moments. Sometimes they're in mundane moments. So often, uh, the moments that should be exhilarating for me fall flat. Mm -hmm. And then other moments where I'm just going throughout my day, I'm shocked by grace. So you miss a sacramental imagination in her, is that it? Yeah, I miss hope. Yeah. I mean, well, I miss a certain kind of hope, because I don't know Melissa and I could go back and forth on that. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's a long time since I read the novels uh, when, the, when they first came out, Gilead and Home. Um, I do remember at the end of Home, uh, feeling, and maybe this is just because I'm an old sentimentalist, um, I, I got to the end and sort of felt, what? Yeah. That, you can't stop now? <laughs> it's, you know, that's not right, okay? There's another chapter, it's hidden behind the index. Um, and that, yeah. I don't know, I, I, part of me was disappointed by that, but at, on the other hand, I suppose the other way of looking at, it, at that is, the fact that I had that reaction at the mm. end is precisely testimony to the skill with which she evokes um, the, this shouldn't be like this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is what Maltman, Jürgen Maltman would say, is uh, that's what uh, so much evocation of hope is about because you do get a sense, again, not by showing it, mm -hmm. but precisely by not showing it, mm -hmm. of how it ought to turn out and it doesn't, yeah. and the pain of that is intense. Mm -hmm. so, so, so back to the formative role of the arts. If, mm. uh, if a writer of fiction is seeking to form in me uh, a desire for more, uh, hope, yeah. uh, some sense of uh, the insufficiency of now, I mean, maybe she does that really well. In fact, maybe, maybe the kind of, I'm a sentimentalist too, maybe the kind of uh, happy moment I want is the sort of thing, at least that in moments, will sate my desire and therefore shrink my desire and therefore actually screw up the proper ordering of love. I mean, I, I don't think it always does that. In, I don't think every happy ending is gonna do that, but I know that if I have a diet of regular, easy happy endings, my hope is squashed. In fact, I, I presume, and therefore I'm, at least Thomas Aquinas' way, I cannot hope because I'm presuming that everything is going to work quickly. And our error, at least for the last few decades, has been in that, towards the sentimental, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. I, I, w I, I would love for uh, Christians to uh, have a more rigorous longing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I'm with Melissa, I'm all for, I'm all for the longing, the open, that the there is, maybe it's an unrealized eschatology, but that's appropriate for a while after you've had quite over-realized. Better, better under-realized than over-realized, yeah. right? Yeah, an open Well, I, see, I, don't, I, open don't, I actually don't buy that. No. <laughs> and and, and there really, it really is about this shuttling back and forth. So, yeah. you know, Thomas Aquinas' yeah. sense that hope lies between presumption and despair. But as I, as I watch students come through, I see many Christian students who don't know how to hope. And I think uh, certainly many of them are, are uh, guilty of presumption, mm -hmm. but I think increasingly I'm seeing generations of students who uh, on some level, they, they, they have a despairing imagination. Yeah. They, they cannot picture, um, they cannot picture the Spirit's transformation of their own lives. They cannot picture um, ways in which God might bend their lives towards Him and towards life. Uh, they're convinced that 
this is just the way that things are? So it, I, yeah. I think that's such a good word um, and true. What I worry about with respect to the stories mm -hmm. we inhabit, uh, that, we, that we hear and tell ourselves, um, is that I wouldn't want for any of us, our students, myself, um, to mistake the, sp the Spirit's transformation um, for the moments when I get what I want. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that feels really hard to me to inhabit kind of a space where I'm still discovering yeah. That, that work of God in my life and in the life of my community without saying, um, it's always at those, those, those moments of conclusion where all is well for a moment or where... Uh, the meal's been good or whatever. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. I mean, Mor Morrissey's got this great song, please, please, please just let me get what I want this time. <laughs> Lord knows it'll be the first time. I mean, and that's the, that, that's the thinnest, most sickly form of, yeah. of, of a bastardized hope, yeah. I think, that we want to avoid. Can, can I ask you all with story, what are hopeful stories? What, what are hopeful stories that you know of, books you've read, st stories you encountered in this kind of the thing that we're trying to approximate and get around right now? So, so Robinson's work certainly could be. Well, you, you guys want stories. I'm, I'm, I work with images, so let me use an image. Um, I mean, I just have been a, written an article on Olga La, which is very much like Lynn Aldridge. In fact, she's been influenced by Lynn, who has an exhibit at the Art Center right now, by the way. And uh, it, th these, pe these Christian uh, installation artists have turned Marcel Duchamp on his head. Because here's somebody who t takes objects ironically and sort of makes them make makes you think about them differently, mm -hmm. but but to de-essentialize them. In fact, that's what uh, Duchamp actually wants to do. He says, "I don't believe in the word being. It's 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 not it it shouldn't exist." So he wants to de-essentialize all these things. Well, here these are. These are minimalist artists who take the, the, the merest object of uh, a garden hose or a lampshade and, or, 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 or uh, paper. Um, what, what Lynn does with, with waxed paper is magical and, and just transforms them and says, hey, these, this, this, is, this is potentially uh, wonderful. This is, and and I, I think there's something profound that's going on in, in, in that. And it gives, you walk in and, and you come out with hope that the world that's filled with all these ordinary things is a kind of magical place because of what they've done with it. I'll, I'll uh, say Shakespeare's Winter's Tale is one of the first pieces mm -hmm. that comes to mind um, uh, as a... Why? Why? Oh, <laughs> um, so so Shakespeare's late plays uh, are. I return to them. I'm, I'm the most fascinated by them. He seems to be able to tell stories at the end of his career that uh, that actually contain, in in multiple senses, uh, the full tragic arc. Um, whereas in his comedies early on, you can see ah, oh, there's the threat of there's the threat of some sort of disaster of. Uh, mm. Of distress in relationships, of of death, and so on. But the the threat's usually more minor, and then the comedy resolves um, resolves things well. Uh, his late plays, I think, include more of a full tragic arc, where someone um, where 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 the sins um, of characters play out in their. Mm -hmm. um, in their acuteness. Uh, some of this has to do with even the time. He, he increases the time that a, that a play will take. So The Winter's Tale has a sort of, um, like, I can't remember if it's uh, like a 14 or 16 year uh, gap. So you get the first three acts and then 16 years later, um, you get the, the final two. Um, and so there's a, there's a sort of fullness of the uh, transgressions um, and losses uh, that are not all resolved. But there's uh, definitely the, this restoration, redemption, and restitution uh, festivity that closes out the. Uh, it, uh, so forgiveness, by the way. I mm, so, so here's what I mm, love about the difference, maybe between um, just doing the tragic thing or doing a comic thing that's that's sort of soft on on what's wrong. Th this play that. I think encompasses that brings in the full um, the full sense of tragedy and human uh, human wickedness and and human accident um, it leaves room for the resolution to have to include to require 
the practice of um, of acknowledgement and forgiveness, mm -hmm. and that strikes me as a particularly um, I, I'll just say hopeful. That's the question you gave. Yeah, yeah. It's a particularly yeah. uh, hopeful project on his part to leave room for not just I didn't mess up or my mess ups mm -hmm. got covered over real fast, but uh, but in fact here's how this world is visited by radical grace. It's in partly in the practice of um, human forgiveness and in the uh, really in all in those late plays. It's also in the work of providence. <laughs> and providence and human forgiveness collaborate to bring about uh, something like happy ending. Thank you. Mm -hmm. hmm. um, I'm fairly brief, I think, and perhaps a surprising choice, but having a couple of minutes to think about it there uh, while Bill and Melissa were talking, I, I think some of Cormac McCarthy's novels I've found among the most hopeful, and I mean the ones particularly bizarrely perhaps that I would say there is a quality of hope about are two of the darkest and, and that's No Country for Old Men uh, and The Road and I mean anybody who's read The Road and let alone anyone who's seen the movie that came out um, has a dark book and yet what, why I say it's a sort of a book with a with hope shot through it is that precisely because of the darkness mm -hmm. there is there are there are glimmers of genuine humanity shot through it um, in a way that it's not idealistic, so it, it shows you humanity at its very worst, that book. Um, and it's not that the, the, uh, the novel seems to be saying, ah, well, despite that, human beings are really quite nice after all. That's not what it's saying. No, no. But there are shreds of goodness in it, mm. which are surprising mm. and striking. And I think the novel's ending, although, of course, it's notoriously ambiguous <clears throat> um, and leaves you wondering what happens next, um, I, I think at the end of the day, it's a hopeful ending. Um, there's enough goodness in there to lead you to suspect that you know grace will out finally, um, despite the darkness of the thing. So I, I'd need to do some more work on convincing anybody that it was a hopeful book. But well, I think and for me, the it is. Eucharistic images where they yeah. come upon this yeah, this plenty, exactly. and all of a sudden they enjoy these moments of yeah. having plenty when they didn't have anything. Yeah. Was clearly a kind of a Eucharistic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, stylistically, McCarthy is interesting to me too because he's it's so lush. And it demands slow reading, which is interesting in the midst of a, a stark landscape. Yeah. So yeah. on the one hand, it's, it couldn't get more depressing, but he's right. reveling in language. Yeah. And he's asking us to slow down with him. Whereas I think yeah. normally we hear dark and depressive and we want to run for the hills. And he forces yeah. us to slow down slow and, and yeah. see the beauty of this place. So there's something there about that. That's a hope-charged uh, yeah. way of seeing things too. John. Uh, uh, lots of things come to mind, but I'll go with this one. Uh, there's a, in, in Mozambique, uh, there's an, an artist group called Nucleo de Arte uh, that uh, after the Mozambican uh, Civil War, which lasted for two decades, three decades, um, they launched this program, um, the kind of Anglican church there, I think the, the archbishop launched this program called um, uh, uh, tools for arms or something like that. Uh, arms uh, for tools arm, for arms. Yeah, yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, w I forget it off the top of my head, where they collected all of these weapons, mm -hmm. decommissioned weapons, in exchange for sewing machines and tools. I guess one village got a tractor. They, had, they gave over so many weapons. <laughs> um, so they had all of these weapons, like uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, these decommissioned weapons, um, and then they commissioned the, this group of artists to, tra to transform those into sculptures, and they made a tree of life uh, out of all of these weapons, um, and so it's called the Tree of Life. I, I think it's still in the uh, British Museum right. um, is where it is, um, and, and I, I think that's a, a kind of, I mean, really concrete visualization of Isaiah, uh, the sort of pounding swords into uh, plowshares, uh, but also this kind of, this image of um, life that is uh, riddled with uh, pain and, and built out of these instruments that were built to destroy, destroy life. So it's a kind of image of the tree of life, uh, a, um, a, uh, an image of something that is lost, tree of life, but a hoping for tree of life. And that's in the context of a world with, I mean, 
uh, machine guns are the least of uh, uh, sort of the least of its weapons. Uh, so in in the world where this is even a feeble act, it's it's a great act of hope, the giving over of one's arms. And yeah. One of the things I like about the the Isaiah image um, is I remember reading one commentary on the passage and the commentator pointing out that actually, of course, all that was was a redeeming of something which originally was good in any case because uh -huh. most arms in those days. Um, it was quite common for people to take nasty, sharp, you know, garden tools or agricultural implements mm -hmm. and turn uh, them into weapons. Yeah. And so, you're, in a sense, you're restoring. So there's nothing intrinsically yeah. bad. Yeah. This has been turned to evil, as any good creaturely thing can, yeah. and now it's being redeemed yeah. um, and turned yeah. back to its original good purpose. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great, that's a great, that's image. Nice. A great yeah. image. If I could just pick up on uh, the Jonathan's great example, because it, something we haven't covered, and one of the things that art allows us to do is to get inside of other cultural imaginations, mm -hmm. which is something that's very difficult for us Westerners sometimes to do. And we just returned from a trip from Cambo to Cambodia and Vietnam and been reading Under the Banyan Tree, which is a new novel which describes the, the Khmer Rouge experience firsthand that her family went through. Mm -hmm. And it, it, this is a powerful a reminder of an otherness that, that's very difficult for us to understand, the, the cultural otherness, the, 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 the rank evil that existed there. But, but I think this is something, a powerful thing that art enables you to do, which enables you then to see yourself in a new way and understand yourself in a way that, 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 you, that you didn't before and couldn't really apart from, from that kind of uh, conversation. So, and it's not just the moral encounter, but it's the encounter with, with really another, partly a religious other, and, but, but also a cultural, uh, a cultural set of values that sometimes just don't compute to us and, and ours to them, and, and to, to try to in, have an engagement with that that can really yeah. be transformative. I and, think and we maybe, should mention. Maybe more broadly, that art helps us do that, and, and the imagination is how we do that. It's exactly. Yeah. Something exactly. About that. I have a friend who is life, mostly lifelong missionary in Cambodia who mm -hmm. came back from his first term and was really out of sorts. Oh, and he realized. It's a dark place. Well, what oh, he realized was he is a white, educated, rich American man who's trying to be a servant. And so every cultural co situation he went into in Cambodia, he tried to defer. Right. Well, he's in a patron-client system right. where everyone knows he's a patron. Yeah. And so he came back, and I think a lot of his process when he was on this leave was to reimagine what it looks like, what it looks like to be a kind, humble, loving, God-honoring patron. And so he went back in and said, this, this is the role I'm playing in this context. Yeah. Now I can do this in, in with a certain kind of humility, but it required a radical reimagining for him, and and the imagination there I, th I think in some ways saved his probably might have saved his life certainly his his time there. Yeah, yeah interesting. And art can help you yeah. negotiate that, yeah. That, yeah. that in a way that other things can't do that. You know. And that's maybe a good model for an artist today to sort of what what, what am I given? Where am I? What am I doing? Mm -hmm. What is in your hands? What's in my hands? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, rather than yeah. defaulting to some other time period or some other yeah. formula. Do, do you all have any thoughts about the uh, the artist's uh, attempt to imaginatively enter into someone else's experience, crossing cultures, crossing genders, crossing time? So, in one sense, I think it's a it's a laudable attempt. In another sense, that uh, is fraught with difficulty, ethical implications. Uh, uh, there's a certain kind of assumption that happens in thinking that, you know, say I could write a story from the perspective of a woman or, or something like that. Any thoughts on that? It does happen, and I think, um, of course, it's, it's, it, we think immediately of the big differences, the big othernesses, mm. so cultural ones or temporal ones. Um, and what we forget is that, um, or what we overlook very easily, is that the same thing is going on um, and sometimes in a very significant way, simply when we engage with a person across the street mm -hmm. whose experience is so different from ours. Um, and, and so the, that process is one that we're constantly engaged in, sort of the ability to stand in someone else's shoes mm -hmm. and sort of feel the world in a quite new way. And we know we can't do it completely. Mm -hmm. We know there can be no perfect historical you know, uh, account of something which puts you in the, the place of a medieval person or whatever. But equally well, we know, perfect, you know we, we do communicate with one another mm -hmm. and with one another when we have very different experiences. And we shouldn't be pessimistic mm -hmm. about the capacity to, the power that imagination has when it's done well, yeah. um, to give us a glimpse, not to become the other person, mm 
um, but in a sense to enter sufficiently into their experience that, that we know how to respond well to them uh, as who we are. Maya Angelou said once that the line that connects you with your own community should be long enough to allow you to spend significant time in other people's community. Yeah. Mm. Well, I think we'll have to wrap up. I'm glad we've got a few hours uh, to talk this afternoon at the Symposium on Making Good. Thank you all so much. What a delight Thank to you. talk Thank with you. you. Thank you. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.